Hi everybody. We are chapter 18, Submerged. Chapter 18, Submerged, is one of the shortest chapters in the book. And part of me is glad that it's so short because it was very hard to write um, because of its subject matter, um, which is Submerged. It was not a happy chapter uh, by any means, and it was a very tough uh, thing to write. There was no sound when the door closed. Joshua expected it to be pitch black, but instead there was a slight glow that emanated from the surface of the tube-like tunnel they stood in. It was just high enough for Creek to walk upright. Its surface was smooth and solid, similar to the outside of the mountain. Joshua followed the tunnel with his eyes, but could not see the end of it. It disappeared far into the distance. Are you ready? Gray asked. No, Joshua answered truthfully, and began to walk into the tunnel. There seemed to be a slight downward pitch to it. The sound of their steps on the ground echoed through the semi-darkness as they made their way ever deeper into the mountain. If the others had any thoughts, they kept them to themselves. Creek was limping slightly. The deep oozing cuts from the vulture had gotten more infected, and Joshua was afraid the infection would spread the longer they walked. The, glow, the low glowing that came from the surface of the stone around them illuminated the wounds and made them appear almost black. Creek also couldn't lift his head, as the height of the tunnel didn't allow it. Gray seemed fine. Nose to the ground, he concentrated on picking out any smells he could detect. Joshua had lost all sense of time. He couldn't tell if they had been walking for hours or just minutes. His talons began to hurt. The smooth granite was hard and unforgiving. He began to feel thirsty. He hoped they would get through this tunnel soon, even though he had no idea what to expect on the other side. There's water ahead, the wolf proclaimed and only a short while later they came to a large puddle. Joshua gratefully drank from it. The horse and Gray did the same. While he drank, Joshua looked down the long tunnel. He realized something that almost made his heart stop. Gray, how far can you see down into the tunnel? He asked quietly. Gray looked ahead, so did Creek. The three of them saw it at the same time. The surface of the water mirrored the slightly glowing ceiling. The further they looked into the tunnel, the closer the surface seemed to come to the ceiling. Far in the distance, the surface of the water and the ceiling met. From then on, the tunnel was submerged. Joshua's heart sank. He looked at his companions. But before he could form a clear thought and communicate it with the others, Creek began to walk into the water. Jump on my back, red one. There's no use standing here. Forward is the only way to go. Joshua flew on the horse's back. He had to drop his head and crouch down so he wouldn't scrape along the ceiling. Gray began to swim next to them. Joshua watched him. Was this where their journey together would end? In a tunnel somewhere deep inside a mountain? Fear crept up inside him, tightening its grip around his chest. He had almost drowned twice. It was probably the worst experience of his life, and he did not look forward to experiencing it again. As they drew closer to the point where the water met the ceiling, he tried to push away the overwhelming feeling of sickness that welled up in him. He had trouble breathing. Joshua. Gray had a tendency to interrupt his thoughts at exactly the right time. I will go first and see what's down there and come back. Creek will not be able to turn around in there. Before Joshua could give any thought to this, Gray disappeared into the blackness. The horse's head stuck out of the water just enough for him to breathe. They waited and waited. After what must have been an eternity, Joshua couldn't take it any longer. I will be right back, he thought to the horse, and with that he jumped. Once underwater, he began to use his talents to push forward, but remembered very quickly that they were useless down here. The water was pitch black. The light on the tunnel's surface was completely swallowed up by the water. He felt a moment of panic, but then he became very still. 
It was as if his mind stopped its activity. He forgot about the question of what would happen if he didn't find an air pocket somewhere. He stopped thinking about Gray and he stopped thinking about his own life. And suddenly it was clear to him. It was clear that he could do only one thing now. He opened his wings and pushed them downward and back, moving his body forward. After a couple of strokes, Gray appeared in front of him. His thoughts were panic-stricken. Follow me, Joshua told him. He turned and swam back to where he came from. He felt the wolf behind him, but the connection to him was fading fast. We're almost there, Gray. Hold on, he thought as he came up from the water. The wolf barely made it, and when Creek realized that Gray was in trouble, he put his head under the wolf's belly and pushed him upward. The wolf hung there, miserably trying to get air into his lungs, but he was alive, and that was all that counted at the moment. Joshua realized that he was able to somehow keep his head above water, at least for now. I'm going back, Joshua thought. No, Joshua, let me rest a while and I'll go back. Gray, Gray replied, still gagging from the water in his lungs. You can't go, Joshua. It's too dangerous, Creek added. There's no other way. I will try to reach you. Keep your mind open. Joshua went under. He figured he would do five strokes with his wings and see where this got him. If he didn't see anything, he would turn back. He looked for some light, or at least a glow, indicating that part of the surface of the tunnel walls were not underwater. When he was at the sixth stroke of his wings, he decided to turn around. He thought he did, but it was so dark that he didn't see at all where he was going, and suddenly he slammed into the tunnel wall. Panic rose in him. He was uncertain which way to go. He decided to go left, thinking that this was the way back to the others. Four more strokes, but he still couldn't see anything. Two more, and he felt his lungs were about to burst. The blackness around him was complete and he tried desperately not to panic. But it was too late. A wave of dizziness enveloped him. His last wing stroke was already very weak. The impulse to take a breath was overwhelming. Before he passed out, he saw a glimpse of a low glow in front of him. He came back to life, lying on the horse's head. He couldn't breathe at first, but then he realized that he wasn't underwater anymore, and that he could take a deep breath and fill his lungs with air. At the same time, it occurred to him that they weren't back where they had started from. His head was close to the ceiling. Gray was treading water next to him. They were inside an air pocket that barely fit the three of them. There was a small space between the water surface and the tunnel ceiling. How did you get here? Joshua asked. We couldn't let you go by yourself, Gray answered. We certainly couldn't, Creek added. Try to hold on to my back. If I let, let the air out of my lungs, I can walk underwater. We must be about halfway between where we started and the other side. I hope so. Joshua was not convinced. He felt numb and weak. He just wanted to rest and escape the feeling that they were buried inside a tunnel, deep inside a mountain. They waited a few more minutes to catch their breath. There was no turning back from here. They would either make it to, onto the other side together or they wouldn't. It was as simple and as terrifying as that. When Creek led Joshua gently into the water, he felt the cold seep into his body. Then the horse's head disappeared and Joshua went under. The wolf was first. Joshua held on to the horse's back as much as possible, thankful to have Creek there with him. He knew that only he knew they only had a very limited window of time and only one shot at this. There was a certain rhythm to the horse's movement that was very reassuring, at least for a while, until Joshua realized that the horse was in trouble. It felt like a convulsion in Creek's back, the strain of walking underwater and the fact that he had to let out half of the air in his lungs weakened him rapidly. Can't hold breath much longer, was what Joshua heard. A second convulsion went through Creek's back. Joshua couldn't distinguish any more between his own and the horse's dizziness, and the attempt to squeeze every ounce of air they had out of their lungs got weaker and weaker every second. Light, Gray shouted in his thoughts, 
and then they saw that the, sur the surface of the water mirrored the glowing walls of the tunnel ahead. Part of Joshua's mind registered that Creek's movement had slowed down. He was about to lose consciousness. If that happened, the horse most certainly drowned. Creek, we're almost there. You can make it. With that, Joshua dug his talons into the horse's back and with his last ounce of strength pushed his wings backwards. Once. Twice. They moved slowly toward the light. One more time and the horse's head came out of the water. Joshua let go and came up as well. They swam as quickly as they could to the water's edge and when Joshua reached it, he looked back and saw that Creek had collapsed. Only his head was out of the water, resting on the stone. The wolves stood there shivering miserably. Are you okay, Creek? Joshua thought. For a while there was no answer, other than the massive chest of the horse moving up and down as he labored for breath. Creek, are you going to be all right? Joshua was too weak to move. I will be okay, Creek's thought reached Joshua faintly. I will be okay. Joshua's last thought, before he fell into a deep and dreamless sleep, was of Elda, and how she possibly could have known that a rooster needed so desperately to learn how to swim underwater. So a funny thing just happened. Uh, when I said uh, chapter 18, Submerged, is short, it's kind of short, but there's actually something else that comes beyond this part that I just read, and I totally... Uh, totally missed that of course um so anyway i'm just gonna keep keep reading we're still in chapter 18 um submerged and the last sentence that you heard was joshua's last thought before he fell into a dream into a deep and dreamless sleep was of elder and of how she possibly could have known that a rooster needed so desperately to learn how to swim underwater For a long time, there was darkness. Wind could feel the bodies of the spiders under her when they carried her deep underground, through tunnels that have never seen the sun, through ancient passageways that never ended. The sound of hundreds of feet crawling over the ground, dampened only by the web that was tightly wrapped around her head, was the only thing she heard. She could hear the spider's feet far ahead and far behind her as they brought her deeper and deeper toward their lair. They did not stop. They did not rest. As if led by an invisible command that left them no choice but to respond, they carried their precious cargo until they reached their destination. The cave was not very high but expansive in length and width. Its floor and ceiling had sharp spear-like crystals sticking out of them. Most of the crystals were covered in spider webs. There was a light source somewhere whose origin wind could not determine. It illuminated the bizarrely shaped growths and cast long shadows on one side of them. The stench that lay in the air was of acid and decay and the unthinkable. The massive vulture sat on one of the jagged pillars, her head cocked to one side. Below her sat two of the hyenas. One had half of her fur missing. It was scraped off, exposing the raw skin and flesh down to several partially decomposed ribs. Her dead eyes were bloodshot. Small veins stood in the sclera, and what had once been white had taken on a yellowish tone. The other had, the other had flesh and skin hanging from their jawbone, and worms crawling in and out of what was left of her ear. Her teeth were bared, revealing black gums. As fast as the spiders had wrapped wind in their first encounter on the surface, they now loosened their ties with hundreds of pincers, tearing, tearing through the silken thread until all of it was gone, except one thick piece tied around each wing and secured to one of the crystalline growths. When she stood up, a wave of dizziness washed over her, her legs weak, she had trouble standing. Spiders covered the ground and ceiling as far as she could see. At least a dozen of them sat right above her, their eyes peering at her, waiting for the smallest command from their master. We meet at last, the vulture's thoughts brought with it the full impact of her malice. Wind could not escape the darkness, hopelessness and despair they induced in her. She felt utterly alone. Yes, 
the vulture exclaimed triumphantly. Alone is what you are and far from home. So far that never again will you reach its comfort, never again stand on familiar ground, never again touch kinship or brotherhood. It will forever be outside your reach. And death will only claim you once you have realized that even then peace will never find you. You will always be searching it, even in the afterlife. The vulture jumped from her perch and landed in front of her. She was a head taller than wind, even on equal ground. I will lay the marks of death upon your soul, and it will burn. The poison will sink deep into it, and there it will fester and make it its home. The vulture's head was now close to wind's. Her one dead eye looked into hers, and suddenly the vulture let out a loud cry. At the same time, she screamed at Wind in her thoughts. Wind moved backwards, trying to avoid her gaze. For an instant, Wind thought she saw the slightest hint of fear in the vulture. Let me ease your passing through the gate, the vulture screamed. With that, she jumped onto the back of the pegasus and dug her talons deep into her skin. Wind's screams echoed through the subterranean lair. They never reached further than that. Joshua thought that he must have slept for quite some time, for when he opened his eyes, his feathers were almost dry. Creek stood a few feet away, looking down at him. Gray sat on the other side. How long did I sleep? Joshua shook himself. Besides a chill that still lingered, he felt surprisingly good. For a while, Gray replied. We all did, and now we should get out of here. Well said, Creek added. They began to walk, away from the water and up the slight incline of the tunnel. Joshua saw that Creek's cuts from the vulture looked much better. The infection seemed to have gone completely, and the wounds were beginning to heal. You're healing well, he told the horse. Yes, I feel much better. The pain in my side is gone almost completely, Creek replied. There must be something in the water that counteracts the vulture's poison, the wolf remarked. Gray thought, Gray's thoughts steered the somber memory of their captured friend in them. They all, in one way or another, tried to keep the thought of Wind's fate away from their hearts. The place where it would lead them was too dark, the sorrow over what would become of her too deep. But as much as they tried, they could not escape the gruesome images their imagination bestowed on them. Joshua could only hope that the images were wrong and just a cruel trick his mind played on him. Creek, who had experienced the vulture's razor-sharp talons firsthand, took it especially hard. They walked in silence for a long time until the light slowly began to increase. Its source came from the end of the tunnel. It still lay in the distance but was now visible as a small opening that grew larger the closer they came. When they reached it and stepped through it, onto a plateau that was covered in thick green moss, they could not believe their eyes. The platform they stood on was suspended high above a deep chasm. Far below and to their right, a waterfall disappeared into the darkness. The falls were illuminated by a beam of light from high above. On the other side of the crevice, across from where they stood, was another platform similar to this one. Beyond it was an opening leading further into the mountain. Both platforms had a narrow tongue of stone reaching toward the other. The middle part was missing. There was a gap easily 50 yards wide. The three friends stood at the edge looking across, dizzied by the sheer drop. They could not see the bottom of the abyss. Joshua thought that he would very possibly be able to make it to the other side. He had gained some strength in his wings since he had left the pen. Creek should be able to make it also, but there was no way the wolf could. Why don't you two go? I'll stay, Gray thought to them. We can't leave you here, Creek replied. You can't stay here with me either. That would no do nobody any good. You have to go and find Wind Creek, and you have to fight the vulture and get her back. I will be happy to stay here, knowing that you will find her and free her. 
The wolf's thoughts hung there like a sword, Joshua felt. Like a sword, Joshua felt. He could not imagine going on without Gray by his side. Do not be concerned with me, Red One, for you have yet to find your full strength and go far beyond yourself. You will not be able to do this if you stay here. I do not wish to find strength within me if this means not to walk with you on my side. I will walk with you, Joshua. There will never be a day in which I will not walk with you. But now you must go. Joshua heard the wolf's thoughts, but their meaning did not sink in. They stayed on the surface without much impact on him. He could not fathom losing his companion, and he would rather stay here and starve to death before he would leave him. Joshua, if you stay here, then all is lost. Wind will have died in vain. We all will have died in vain. You must go, I beg of you. Gray's thoughts were unyielding. Joshua looked at him. Then he slowly retreated from the edge and went backwards toward the tunnel. Don't be so stubborn. You cannot hold off the inevitable. The wolf's thoughts were loud and powerful in his mind, accompanied by a low snarl. Joshua realized that he meant what he thought completely. I cannot, Gray. If this is the end of the journey for you, it is the end for me as well. Then you are responsible if Crete does not find wind. Do you want this? Do you want to prevent him from seeing his beloved again? No, I do not wish to see him suffer. But neither do I wish to see you die alone with no one but yourself to comfort you. We all go, or none of us does. Creek's thoughts reached them both, abruptly ending their quarrel. You make no sense, Warhorse, the wolf replied angrily. And you must learn that you will never again be left behind, Creek answered. There was a moment of silence, during which they looked at each other seeing in one another what they could have never dreamed of before they began this journey. They knew at that moment that whatever happened, their friendship would abide. Here is what we will do. There was a warrior in Creek that he thought had been lost in endless battles with no purpose. He fought his way to the surface, for now he found something he could fight for and believe in, and when this purpose rose inside him, the warrior stood up and took control. Gray, jump on my back. I will carry you to the other side. Joshua, you will follow us once we have landed safely there. Without waiting for an answer, he went to the edge and unfolded his wings, testing their strength with, with several powerful strokes. Come now, wolf, and do not think twice on it. Joshua looked at Gray, who met his eyes. He nodded slightly. The wolf turned and trotted back ten yards. He stood there for a moment and then charged toward, forward toward the horse. When he jumped, Creek pushed his massive wings down, and when the wolf landed on Creek's back, he lifted off. For a moment they hovered there. Then they dropped like a stone. Joshua saw them disappear below the edge. He ran toward it, and when he got there and looked over the rim, they were far down already, dwarfed against the blackness of the abyss. He saw Creek's wings move, working against the fall, the sound of it echoing eerily through the cave. Fear gripped Joshua's throat. He thought about plunging after them, but he heard Creek's faint thoughts that told him unmistakably to stay where he was. Joshua felt po absolutely powerless, unable to watch them and unable to look away. How long is an instant? How long can it stretch out? For Joshua, this one felt like an eternity. Until slowly, too slowly, the horse gained height. You can do it, Creek, he thought to himself over and over. Don't give up, please. Joshua tried, as if by the sheer power of his mind, to lift his friends up and carry them to safety. There was an instant, just before they made it to the other side, when Joshua saw in the horse's eyes that he fought for his life and the life of the wolf, only a few feet below the edge. His strength had left him, but he still pushed on, trying desperately to gain the last short distance to safety. 
And then Joshua saw the wolf jump off and land on the other side. Creek followed, collapsing right where he landed. Come to us, Joshua heard Creek's thoughts. Gray looked at him across the gap. Joshua could see the terror still looming in his face. He peered down into the abyss. The light wasn't able to penetrate the darkness far below. Joshua's heart pounded against his chest. Creek lifted up his head. Do it now, Joshua. Joshua knew that if he were to think about this, he would lose all hope of ever doing it. So he locked eyes with Gray and pushed off, his wings unfolding. He tried not to look down, but it was as if a magnetic force pulled his glance downward. Stay with me, Gray demanded, and Joshua did. The wolf's eyes became his guide, and he flew across the large gap and landed safely on the other side.